Now, you're king for the day, you can do whatever you want to do in racing, and you're almost best known for your criticism of watering. Mm. The way racecourses now, there's never any hard going as there used to be in the old days. I'm making you a king for the day with two crowns on your head. What are you going to do about watering? Um, it's an enormously complex question, and I certainly would not ban watering. Uh, not now. Uh, nor would I in the past. The great change came roughly in the early 1980s uh, when the jockey club changed the watering rule. The original watering rule was that watering should only take place to promote a healthy growth of grass. That was a very good rule. And that meant that the downland courses just got watered enough to get the grass to grow uh, and no more. It was changed in the 80s because there was a very hard summer and the fields were small and some of the big horses weren't running and there was an outcry from the press. And a very small change came in which very few people noticed which said that watering could take place to produce, I forget the phrasing, good safe racing ground or, or ground no firmer than good to firm. And this resulted in a very long and complex and to some people boring to other people interesting chain of events. When you race on downland courses, which would be your Epsoms, your Goodwoods, uh, your Brightons, Lewis in the old days, those sort of courses, if you look back in the old racing calendars, they knew when to race. They only raced in midsummer. The idea being that you should never cut into the sward of grass. So rather like the lime kilns in Newmarket is just, just saved for good fast ground only. And those downland courses only raced then. Now once they allowed them to race at other times and also allowed them to water to produce good to firm ground, it meant that the natural sward got kicked out. And once that grass got kicked out, you had to sow quicker growing grasses so that the next meeting could take place and you had to water. Now, the quick-growing grasses, their roots don't go down for moisture like the downland turf. They go out sideways because they're being watered from above. Therefore, the grass kicked out more. So, what happened was all the race courses were compelled to start watering and planting quick-growing grass in order to race again quickly. Now, the quick-growing grasses have taken over almost all the courses, and particularly now the, the downland courses. And if you don't water that grass, it will die quickly on the downland courses because its roots won't go down. And on the other courses, the roots are going sideways and it gets kicked out. So you've got to water more and more and more, rather like an alcoholic, in order to re retain the status quo. So you cannot now stop watering. The damage has been done. Bath, for instance, though, no watering there. I'll deal with Bath on its own later. Um, but all the other courses are watered. And so the damage has been done. The natural sward on every course, particularly the downland courses, is now gone. Uh, you've got quick grey meadow grasses which need to be watered. So a degree of watering is now essential. Now, to keep the grass... The alternative of letting it go back would take 15 or 20 years and impossible ground to Is that the reason there's the ridging coming in now? Yarmouth so, are trying to do something about the ridges at Yarmouth, for instance. A, that's another one. That's another problem which is caused by the, the um, top surface being soft and the firm underneath. And when the machines go over it, it, any little bump, it gradually accentuates and so the ridges start to come. So the damage has been done when the Jockey Club changed that rule in the 1980s. The, the cure is so awful, the cold turkey, that no one can deal with it. Therefore, a degree of watering is now essential. Uh, probably less watering rather than more would be the answer to keep it all going longer. But um, it's a very difficult problem. You mentioned Bath. Well, Bath, of course, has no watering system and attracts quite decent fields in the middle of the summer, people who do really want firm ground horses, um, ground for firm ground horses. Where Bath ran into trouble was that they started 
under Lord Whig it was originally, who made them race at different times of the year, it meant that they started to race in the spring and late in the autumn and cut through that sward. So originally at Bath we only raced in midsummer, as did Devon and Exeter and places like that jumping. Um, and so where it ran into trouble was being made to race late in the year and early in the year, uh, which meant that it got cut up more than it had done in the past. And so the natural sward has been punctured a lot. It is not as good as it used to be Bath 40 years ago. Um, and I had a double there at Bath a couple of years ago, and it was so firm that it looked like the beginning of Lawrence of Arabia. Do you remember when the sand, all you saw was this cloud of sand, and eventually the camels came into view? <laughs> and, and it was so firm. But, you know, it suited a couple of horses, and we had a couple of winners. Uh, and I think it's a good thing that, that there is variety, as we'll probably come to later. You come to national hunt racing, Never again will the word firm be in the um, going description, say, at the Cheltenham Festival, yeah. entry for the national. Is that... Surely that's for the good of the game as far as the public is sure. concerned and the horses. I'm sure it's for the, uh, for the good for the public and, and the horses. And I, as I've said, I think a degree of watering is, is, is essential now. Um, whether that would have been the case um, had you not messed around with the ground, who knows? But we've got to deal with what we've got, and we've got to water to a degree. People say that because of watering, the breed is getting weaker now. Yes, I think that's right. Um, and there's an inevitable consequence. Um, in the old times, uh, I remember when I started looking around yearlings with Mr War over 45 years ago, and he drilled into me the first question when you saw a yearling is, will this horse go on firm ground? And he made me research it, and 70% of flat races took place on ground that was firm or firmer. Hard. Just imagine that. So 70% of them. So the very first question you ask yourself is, will it go on the firm? Because for it to be effective for 75% of the season or 70% of the season, um, it would need to go on firm ground. And uh, I remember Major Holiday, who bred his own horses, and a uh, nightmare man to train for, and Walter Wharton was training for him. And, but the punters loved him. Oh, yeah. And, loved him. and Walter was walk, riding back, and the major riding back beside Walter, the major on a beautiful little cobble, double reins and grey uh, kid gloves, and, and riding beside Walter. And, and as we walked in, um, he said to me, he said, oh, uh, my trainer's displeased with me, you know, Sir Mark. So I said, well, why is that, Major? I can't imagine. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, I wouldn't let him walk, work them on the water gallop, he said. Um, and he said, I said to him, if my horses have to work on a water gallop, I don't want to breed from them. He said, what he doesn't realise is that I'd buy him the water gallop if I thought it would do him good. So he was breeding a, a strain of horses entirely to go on firm ground. But they used to advertise in the old days for stallions, legs of iron. Yes. They used to be the adverts as a, as a selling principle of going to that horse, yeah. legs of iron. Well, and, uh, you know, there's a very interesting conundrum. I've never sort of thought of it much before. But, you know, with the propensity for Sadler's Wells horses to need some cut in the ground, there is a question, had he been around 100 years before, would he have been as successful a stallion? Uh, as he was coming along after watering. Who knows? It's a, that's something for Tony Morris or somebody to look up. If you think of our racing in Britain and in Ireland now, the variety compared to what there is overseas, generally, say, America, which is always going left-hand, the majority of it on dirt, not many long-distance races, how can we keep and even enhance the variety and the attraction of our racing, both for new people to come in, owners and um, the punters and the public. What would you do as dictator to enhance the variety of British racing? Well, you've rather stolen my thunder because this was going to be one of my, my points as king for the day, that I would try and benefit wherever I could any measure which increased diversity. Um, so I would try and ensure that all courses raced over every distance, um, 
whether there be some rule to the effect or not, I don't know, but, but that every distance from five furlongs to two and a half miles should be catered for. Two and a half? How many possible. times will a race course have to race over well, two and a half miles whatever, under your dictatorship? Whatever it is, more often than they do now, you know. Um, and um, I think that the reason foreigners love British racing is because of its diversity. You go left-handed, right-handed. If your horse wants soft ground, firm ground, uphill, downhill, all weather, there's some five furlongs, two and a half miles, there's something for him. And it enables our horses to have careers much more so than in any other country. Because instead of being confined to seven furlongs to a mile and one, if your horse is a bit slow but he can stay, he can go and run two and a half miles here. And if he has a job getting home, he can run five furlongs down the hill at Catterick and round the turn. So it gives all of our horses, if you're interested in horses and you want them to have as good a career as they can, it really gives them much more chance. The more variety we can give, it gives punters more, it gives owners more, and I think there's a dangerous trend to be gradually, gradually, gradually homogenising both the courses and the distances that they run over. And would you have um, apprentice races, amateur races? How would you lay down, as a dictator, the various distances you want with courses, and can you compel courses to run over a... Uh, well, the, the Office of Fair Trading say we can't, so that's the end of it. So uh, not only being king for the day of racing, I shall need to be king for the day for the country. Mm. But, uh, uh, yes... Uh, I, uh, Prescott in number 10 would uh, appeal to many. <laughs> I, would, I would have to do something, uh, if I could, to some form of legislation whereby so many two-year-old races, so many amateur races a season, so many apprentices, so many whatever it is, anything to I encourage variety. And I'm always, I'm not a national hunt man nowadays, but I'm always disappointed when there's all the fuss about the cross-country race. If you don't want to watch it, don't bother. Go and have a drink in the bar, go and have a chat with someone. Lots of people like it. And it's not, uh, I don't think we want a country where over 50% have to want everything. Uh, good luck to the diversity. I I'm all for it. You're a, a meticulous planner of the race planning book and where your horses run. Who are the least considered part of the species, either as an age group or a distance group, who do need more nurturing, do need more looking after on the flat? What, by providing races yes. for them? Um, I think it's pretty well balanced, John. I think, um, I think probably... The, the stayers and the, the, the extreme sprinters and the extreme stayers probably need a bit more. And the ones in the middle, I think we've got a very balanced programme. And you've raced all over the world. You're dictator of British racing. There is no better racing anywhere than, than in our country. You would accept that? Oh, uh, absolutely. And I think the, the great reason for that is, is the diversity, the diversity of people, diversity of training centres, trainers training on their own, not on the race course, our characters, and therefore all become more apparent. Um, yes, I think it, it's still the best racing in the world, even though it's, it's funded so poorly. I'm surprised that you're a king for the day. The only disciplinarian aspect you will bring in would be overuse of the whip and you would bar, uh, the horses would lose the race. But you've mentioned nothing about drug testing, dope testing, both of humans, the jockeys, and of the horses. Surely the integrity of racing is the single most important thing that you, as a dictator, should be trying to enhance. I think they've had a good bash at that. Uh, and... Um... I, I think that um, one of the things I, under the old jockey club, you know, the, the old jockey club, they hadn't a f clue about uh, publicity and PR and, and finances, and but they understood horses really, really well. And all their edicts were horsemen's edicts. I think we were very well catered for. Now we have people who understand very well publicity and marketing and, and all of that and understand less well the horse. So I've confined my king for the day, as I said at the beginning, to really the horse things about, about which I do know. And the drugs, I think, in racing, in horse racing, is a surprisingly small problem. I think there is more problem with that in, 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 in the sales ring. Uh, than there ever is in, 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 in racing. And when I went to see my old governor, Jack War, and he was dying, um, he was lying in bed at Addenbrooke's, and almost the last words he said to me, 
He said, now then, boy, he said, in my time, all the villainy in racing was in the betting ring. In your time, it will be in the sales ring. Pretty far-sighted remark. Sir Mark Prescott knows all about villainy. King for the day.